morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, and welcome back. Welcome back to the Porsche Cool Podcast. My name is Michael Bath. Welcome back if you've been here before, and welcome if you haven't. Uh, today is Tuesday, and today is uh, Owner Stories. We're up to number 39. Uh, I'm going to have a very short introduction today. I'm not going to mess around because I'm running a little bit late. Uh, it's uh, it's morning here in London, and I've got David coming in uh, this morning from New Zealand. So it's evening over there in New Zealand. Uh, I'm not 100 percent sure where David is in New Zealand, but I'll ask him once he comes on. But let's uh, it, it's going to be a good one today. I always say that, but it, every story is different, and that's what I love about owner stories. I mean, there's always that similar thread. There's always that common bond that we all have. But every every story is just that little bit different. So. Um, David's got a good one. He's got a lot of cars. I'm going to have to try and get it in, uh, keep it within the hour. We may go a little bit over, Um, but let me just get David uh, through Zoom and let's get him to talk about his Porsche Cooled owner's story. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to Owner's Stories number 39. I didn't forget today. It's number 39 of the Owner's Stories. Uh, And today I am joined by David and David's coming in from New Zealand. Good morning, David. Thanks for uh, coming on Owner's Stories. Good morning, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm glad you, um, you're one of the few people that reached out to me, uh, that have reached out to me by Facebook. Not many people reach out to me by Facebook, and, and I'm a little bit slow in, repl- in responding to the Facebook messages because I don't always check it. Um, but it's funny, uh, Paul from New Zealand, who's been on a previous owner's stories, I don't know whether you know of Paul from Auckland, who's in the Porsche Club. I, I Yep, I had lunch with Paul today. You yep. did. I see him. Uh, yep. So you're a friend of Paul's? I see him a lot. I drove a 3.2 Carrera today, which was a marvelous experience. Lovely. Yeah, because when you first sent me the message, David, I was thinking, okay, there's a similarity here. Paul's got the 3.2 Carrera G50, right? And then he's got the yeah. uh, 328 GTS. Um, when we mm. get into your story, people have an idea of what you have, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it when we get into the story. There's a similarity mm. there with, with the cars. So I'm always interested, mm. um, David, with places like New Zealand – and Adelaide, which I've said before, um, there seems to be a really strong car culture and a strong car community, Porsche community, car community. And there's also always a lot of interesting cars. What is it about, what is it about Auckland, you think, that, that, that has that, or New Zealand in general, that has that sort of car culture? Where does that come from, you think? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, Auckland's ground zero in terms of, you know, the financial, you know, centre of New Zealand and, and, um, and, um, um, I live in the Eastern Bay, it's just around from the city. Uh, and so um, I actually live not far from a, a road called Tamaki Drive, which is the waterfront, you know. So so on a Saturday, Sunday afternoon, it's just jam-packed full of everything you'd ever want to see. Um, uh, but, but then outside of that sort of cruising type culture, you know, there, there's some pretty strong car clubs. And I'm, I'm, of course, a member of the Porsche Club. I've just joined the Ferrari. Well, I'm trying to join the Ferrari Club, subject to a, um, a good background check. <laughs> once they, Oh, really? Like, yeah, you want to say check me out? And um, yeah, so what is uh, it? A long process, is it? Sorry, is it a long process to get into the Ferrari Club? No, well, I don't think so. I've had a Ferrari for two and a half years, and 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 Paul and others have been pestering me to join the club, and I've kind of yeah, yeah, I'll get onto it. So we went for a Ferrari run the other day, and I was a passenger. And I thought, yeah, they're pretty good people, actually, you know. So I might join up. So I um, I sent <laughs> off an, an email and I said, yeah, we'll get back to you and and we'll approve you. Uh, once we've um, checked your references or whatever, so I, I imagine asking oh, okay. that I'm a good a good character. And so you think you think you're in. You think you're in. I think so, but having a GT4 Dino is kind of the bottom of the pile. So they, I don't know maybe that is exciting. I don't know why <laughs> don't we're going to talk. About, I don't, we're going to talk about that. I know this is mm. you know push called under stories, but you you know you have a Ferrari, and I want to talk about that because I think that's a that's a very uh, underrated Ferrari. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, and I watched Magnus Walker, and I've said it before. I watched Magnus Walker. I don't know if you saw that video that he did on yeah, Haggerty's yeah. channel. And I thought that yep. was a really good video. You know, the guy that owned it in LA, the guy that was, had his car, and he said it was reasonably trouble-free. And we mm. should talk about that. But let's get into the yeah, first sure. question that all the listeners are always waiting for, and they always like this question and the last question of the of the podcast. So when did um, we know you have you know you own a couple of Porsches? When did you first start noticing them? Um, and I always say, for me, it was a little bit later in life, only because where I lived, there wasn't many Porsches on the road. Mm. Uh, it wasn't that sort of area. It wasn't an affluent area. There wasn't many, uh, you know, nice cars around. So when did it start? When did you start first noticing uh, Porsches? Was it when you were a kid, or was it when a little bit later in life? How did it all start for you? It was very early. So um, um, I actually remember the time and the time and place when I first saw. Um, what what turned out to be a 911 and and I remember where I was living and so that that dates it for me and it was in a magazine I think it was advertising a 
you know how they, they have a front end of a porch with a, a guy sitting on it and a girl standing off to the side. So it's probably advertising some sort of lifestyle type product or shampoo or sunscreen yeah, or whatever yeah. it is. And, and I said to my dad, I, I think I was seven or eight years old maybe, to my dad, what's that? And he, he told me what it was. But but then I don't remember much else from that uh, till I was probably, you know, 10, 11, 12, and it came on really strong then, you know, just um, – and my father bought a lot of car magazines, uh, mainly Australian ones, Modern Motor and Wheels. And, uh, and so I started reading those. And there's some fantastic articles. And, and one I distinctly remember, uh, I think the journalist, um, is, it, is it Jeff Carter? I, 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 the name escapes me. Could be Jeff Carter. Sure. But, but anyway, yeah, but anyway, he, um, he wrote a series of articles of his experiences with you know, going to Germany and buying Porsches. And, and um, I was just fascinated, absolutely fascinated. So you know, back in those days, you couldn't just find out stuff. There was no internet or anything like that. So it was all magazine based. And, um, you know, we lived in a, in a two and a half hours from Auckland in a seaside town called Mount Monganui and uh, a bit further north than that. And so you just never saw anything. And, uh, you know, back in those days, there was, there was just not that sort of car on the road. Very rare to see Mercedes, BMWs, Porsches. They were just very, very rare. Um, yeah. So and because my father was into cars, we'd, we'd, sort of come up to Auckland to visit some relatives and we'd disappear off for half a day around the high-end car dealerships. And I just remember, you know, back then these Porsches were relatively new, but, you know, for me, it was just, uh, I was just blown away, just stunned, you know, I'd uh, you know, hop in them, um, you know, the smell, you know, the, if, if, a, if a salesman was moving it around the yard, I was just fascinated. And I, I just thought, what, what the hell do I need to do? What do I need to do to get to one of these? Um, you know, very, very strong recollection of just being totally blown away by 911s, you know, old 911s, uh, which, which in those days were new, um, new cars. So what were the cars in the, at that time you were looking at? Were they 993s or were they um, before no, the, no. the 80s? No, no. So, yeah, so, um, uh, so I'm over 50. So this was back in, um, this would have been yeah, 81, 82, 83, sort of around that time. And so they were um, still old air cooled, you know, the G series. Um, and there's a lot of long hoods into the F series on, on the yards because they're only by then only 10 or so years old, you know, 18 yeah, years yeah. old. So, um, but I, I distinctly remember one of them in a, in a car yard, a, um, a silver Carrera 3.0, you know, 76, 77 tartan trim just blew beautiful, my mind. Beautiful. The one, the sought after one now, yeah, isn't it? Yep. Everyone wants that. Yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, kind of a little absolutely. bit like you. It was like, you know, I mean, in Sydney, it was the same thing thing for me when I moved to Sydney. It was like all those car dealers that you used to see, you know what I mean? And I mm. remember walking down, this is when William Street in Sydney, the main, you know, the street from King's Cross to the city, had lots of car dealers. And I remember the Ferrari dealer was there. And just seeing those, you know, seeing those um, those cars in the in the showroom for the first time was just amazing. You know, the, the, the mm. curves and the, and the shape of them and thinking, and like what you said, and like what a lot of owners have said, you know, you're, you're younger and you see these cars and you think, how am I going to get there? You know, mm. how am I going yeah. to get there? And we all know it doesn't happen, David, it doesn't happen straight away. Mm, so we go on a bit sure. of a, yeah, we go on a bit of a journey, don't we? So we go on a bit of a, on a, bit of a journey to get there. So mm. what was the, after seeing those Porsches and, and, and going to Auckland and seeing them in the dealers and, and just watching them, what was the first car that you thought, <clears throat> okay, this will do for now and th- this, is a, this is a memorable type car that I'm going to remember for the, for the rest of my life? Yeah, so you mean in terms of, a, of, of the Porsches? Yeah, and what sort of model? No, not necessarily mm. Porsche. What, how did your mm. car journey go when you first started thinking about cars? What did you, what did you first get into or what was the first one that you, you still oh, okay, think is right. a great yeah. car today? Yeah, so, so my first cars were, were practical-based. Um, uh, so uh, my, my first job when I was a young fellow, it was 35 kilometres from home, which, which isn't a lot, but in a New Zealand sense, it is quite a lot. And so it was a, a little bit of a drive. So it was all about practicality, fuel economy, because I was getting paid nothing. You know, yep. fuel was cost me $35 a week to fill up. Um, so it was all about that. So it was, um, you know, early Corollas, I can't remember the number, but 70, 72, you know, Corolla Coupes, even had a Daihatsu three cylinder because it was all about economy, you know, just yeah, getting yeah. places. But 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 all the way along, um, knowing that I could probably afford some nicer things like uh, Alpha Suds or Golfs, you know, Mark One Golfs or whatever. But just conscious of the fact that hey, I've just I've just got to get to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? and the car's yeah. going to be well used, isn't it? It's going to like devalue. Yeah. It's going to it's just a practical car, yeah. like we all have. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I started out very ordinary in terms of just what you could afford, and uh, and my friends had similar cars, you know, Ford Escorts, uh, Datsun twelve hundreds, you know, those those sort of things. So um, I sort of wasn't any different to them, but yeah, I always had an eye on the, the better type cars that 
you know, we were for sale in, in the city called Tauranga, which is not far from where I was. And and they were the next level, like the Fiat 124 Coupes, Alpha Suds, you know, Mark 1 Golfs, um, Lancia Beaters, you know, those sort of next type level um, that were probably two or three times the value of my Corolla. But but again, it was uh, just from a practical point of view, I'm pretty disciplined as, as a person. So it's like, yes, um, that that's where I've got to get to. But to get there first, I have to do this, which is, you know, be practical, save some money, do the right thing. Don't get up. Don't get up your neck and it don't buy a car that's going to be trouble so yeah it 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 probably took three or four years to get to some interesting cars i suppose from the ordinary cars yes i guess the first um, the first interesting car i had which is probably not interesting was a fed uno <laughs> oh, okay. you know, but uh yeah um it was a why, why was it interesting uh, what was it about that car um just a just Italian quirky, you know, just different. It um it, it sort of represented to me something different to the normal Japanese or English type cars that that my friends had. Yeah, and it yeah. was um yeah, yeah you know it was, I think it was car of the year. It was uh, it was pretty stunning. It was a it was a seventy year, so it was the, the top of the range, not a turbo, but so it was very capable, drove really well, super economical, and um yeah, so that was that was kind of the the first you know the first dip into something different. I so is, is this where the Italian bug? The Italian thing started with you after having that yeah. that Fiat Uno. That's when it sort of you know the Ferrari thing started coming into the yeah. forefront. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, like uh, I've always my first love has been Porsches, but Ferraris are right there too. And uh, you know, while I while I didn't sort of lust after Ferraris in the same um, way, it's because I, I saw them as unobtainable. You know, they were just so much more than 911s or anything. So I I just thought, well, you know, uh, forget about it. <laughs> You know, you'll never get there. Yeah, yeah, because it's much more expensive, isn't mm. it? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Ferraris yeah. are mm. more expensive, usually have mm. lower miles. Porsches are tend to be a little bit less expensive, or they used to be, not anymore. Mm. And yeah. they, they mm. always tended to have higher mileage, right? Because people who bought Porsches yep. most of the time drove them, especially the 80s yeah. and ni- 80s ones, which is why they have so many high, you know, high mileage and, and et cetera. Yeah, yeah um, that's right, yeah. So... Let's get into let's get into where you are today. Then let's let's start talking about the cars. Um, so when did the when did the first Porsche enter your garage? Is that one of the current ones you have now, or was that a previous one that you've you've no, got? No, it's, it's a previous one. Yeah, yeah. So yes, I guess from 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 my early life, as as I described, I was I was under twenty, I suppose, and. Um, and then I got my first Porsche at 39, and that's a big gap, you know. But um, I, I desperately wanted one the whole way through. But again, it was that practicality, like, hey, you, you know. And, and and I guess the important thing for me was that it was such a dream that that if I got the wrong one or a bad one, it would destroy it. So um, you know, we we uh, I got married. Um, you know, we had kids. We were doing houses and whatever, you know, all those sort of things. And then when I was 39, so you know, almost 20 years later, I thought, right, now's the time. And um, again, the practical part of me jumped in and said, well, what's the best deal called Porsche? And it was a, for me, it was a 993. And so I managed to track down uh, a 993, which um, it was a unicorn car. It was 10 years old. This was in 2007. Okay. It had done 25,000 25, Ks. It was a, a New Zealand new Vario Ram coupe with no options, silver, Mercedes-Benz, brilliant silver, special color, black leather. Just absolutely, you know, it'd been on the ground all its life, basically, and, and wow. so the guy sold it uh, to me, and so and so that was it, and it was the the best nine hundred three you could buy, ten years old, twenty five thousand k's, unmarked, you know, didn't even have a stone chip, and so it was. Uh, I was blown away by it, of course, because I, you know, I didn't even drive one before I before I bought that, but I knew it would be good, and um, yeah, so it was a it's a fantastic car, but at the same time, um, only in the two years, which was amazing. You know, my uh, my dream had come true, but um, it became a liability because I started keeping a spreadsheet, so I didn't overdo the mileage. You know, because it was you oh, know, okay. the value wasn't it's you know low miles, it was perfect, and 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 I'm not the sort of guy who likes to just keep things in a garage, so it it, it ate my head off um, that I was driving it. <laughs> and using it okay yeah absolutely. so was it was it priced at a sorry david was it priced at a premium when you bought it way back then yeah um yeah not so much uh it, it definitely was as a car you know it was probably 10 or 15 or twenty thousand dollars more than a than a, a well-used one um but back in 2007 there was enough 993 manuals for sale that you could choose from two or three of them in new zealand at, at least and and uh, yeah, while it was the most expensive one on sale, it wasn't overly expensive. But um, yeah, it was that practical thing again. I I want the best. I don't want I don't want trouble. You know, I want the best thing I can get. Right. So you found a great nine nine three. It's got low mileage. It's in the perfect color. 
it's manual, right? Six speed manual. Yeah, manual. Yeah, manual. Yeah. Um, mm. So, is this? We always go back to this common thread in in the podcast. In you know, when I'm when it's Steve and I talking, or even in owner stories about buy the Porsche you can afford. Um, and I'm not saying this in any bad way, but is this because did you push yourself at that time to buy that car? Was it a little bit more expensive than what you wanted to pay, or you were just worried um, about future values? Um, no, I, I was just I was dead set on getting the best one I possibly could, and. Um, yeah, interestingly, at the same time, there were a couple of 3.6 turbos for sale, X88, um, and they were only ten or $15,000 more. So, so in retrospect, you know, maybe that was a better one, but I think I was just afraid of, uh, you know, as I've owned classic cars now for quite a while, and, and many of them, I'm used to the, you know, spending money on them. It's just what you do. But back then, I was terrified. I was thinking, shit, if this thing drops me in for a five thousand dollar bill or whatever i'm i'm finished i'm done for so that right, was really right. important yeah 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 but it was a reliable car was a reliable 911 when you had it you didn't seem to have any issues with it oh this is perfect yeah nothing perfect. nothing at all yeah yeah perfect so yep. going back to those first memories you know going back to that seeing the car and, and being and going to auckland and seeing those cars in the showrooms how was that when you can you can you remember the feeling you had when you drove that car for the first time and you and it and you realize as we all do that this is this is my porsche this is my 911 yeah, yeah, it, it was fantastic because I'd, I'd waited so long and um, spent so much. Um, you know, it wasn't easy. I, I was, you know, I wasn't, you know, thirty nine years old, and you know, things were going okay, but it was still a lot of money then. And um, no, I, I was, I was wrapped, you know, and uh, and uh, you know, even my mum sent me a card to say, you know, congratulations, you've, you've, <laughs> you, you know, you've you've got your dream, and, and yeah, that's great because yeah, she, she remembered, you know, much, she remembered, yeah, yeah. 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 And um, yeah, so it was incredibly special, you know, just um, yeah, driving this thing for the. You know, and reveling in every moment. But um, yeah, but again, I think I learned a good lesson from that car, and that is that I I like to drive, I like to do things to them, and that one you just couldn't touch it. You know, it was uh, yeah, so it's poison chalice, really. Yeah, mm. yeah, I understand. All right, so you've mm. had that Porsche, you've had that nine nine three, uh, perfect spec. So then, do you think you know you're worried about the mileage and worried about the value? Do you go mm. the next car that comes along? Is it a Porsche or is it something else? Yeah, so uh, so in between all these Porsches, um, like leading up to you know 2007, I had all sorts um, uh, of impractical cars, you know, um, that I bought and lost a lot of money on, and all, all those things I said about I'm worried about the big bills. Um, totally contradict that in terms of depreciation. <laughs> and, <laughs> so yeah, so there's a, a long, long story. like after the Fiat Uno, I had a um, Alpha Sprint QV, um, which was followed by lots of. European hot hatches, you know, uh, Citroen AX GTs, Peugeot um, 106s, um, a series of Mazda MX-5s. I discovered those three WRXs, four WRXs, just lots of – and then I got into motorsport BMWs, not not M series, but oh, – sorry, M series, not M3s or anything, but the yeah, M series. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I generally – I think I had seven in a row. I generally bought the – the, the best spec six cylinder version of whatever it was, be it an E39, E46, E60, um, you know. Uh, so, so a lot of that was on the way to the uh, 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 to the Porsche. So, yeah, um, yeah. So I was sort of used to you know having having nice cars outside of that, but the you know the Porsche was definitely the pinnacle of the other thing. Yes, yeah, so I guess when I sold the 993, um, there was always something beside it which was desirable or nice, and you know then it then I went on to. Golf hours, Scirocco hours, GTIs, you know, um, all that sort of stuff as well. Good value. Well, reasonably good value, yeah. not cheap cars. Good value, but yeah. great driving cars. So you like the driving cars. Yep. You like the European yep. cars. Um, mm. yep. And so do you do track days and things like that, or you just like driving on the, yeah. on the great roads in New Zealand? You know, I do, yeah. So, so uh, back in the late 90s, I did, uh, early 90s, I did a lot of clubs sport with um, with an mx5 actually I, I built one up as a, as a as a club car and um it was nothing special but it was a wonderful car to just learn stuff and then um my orange 911t was actually built um to be good on the track and and so um, didn't didn't race it but did a lot of track days in that um for, for many years mm. okay so the next porsche what comes along so you've got we know well you have three cars in your garage at the moment right you did have four yep. you just told me before yep. we started going on recording that you sold one recently what yep. what came next out of the current collection? Was there another Porsche that came along before the two that you have now? Was is is are yeah. we getting into those ones now? Yeah, there was. Yeah, so um, uh, the next one was really the nine eleven T, but that that started as a as a bit of a wreck and a restoration journey. So um, 
Uh, but but just prior to that, only nine months prior, I came across a, a 964. Um, and again, a, a unicorn car in this country. It was a New Zealand new, which is important, manual five-speed coupe, um, red with black leather, just a, a, a wonderful car. And um, I think they only sold, and, and uh, someone will correct me, but half a dozen New Zealand new manual coupes, you know, because uh, obviously that was sort of, you know, a bit of a recession, you know, they didn't move too many 964s. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so I came across this one, and, and, it, and in those days it was worth about a quarter of what it is now, you know. It wasn't, I think it was 30, 37 and a half thousand, and it just wasn't moving, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, which is incredible, you know. Yeah, um, they were cheap, weren't they? Yeah, and, yeah. And look yeah, at the prices and, uh, now. I'm sure New Zealand's the same as what Australia is. I mean, is. 964s yeah. and 993s, what's happened in the last six months? It's just gone crazy. Yeah, yeah as you said. So, so that was the second one, and, um, and there's a bit of a gap between the 993 and that because we did some, um, you know, we had to big, buy a bigger house and, and that sort of stuff. Yes, yeah, so, um, yeah, so again, really cool car. Um, um, everything was right about it. drove superbly. Um, and and I, I started to use it on the track a little bit. Uh, and, um, yeah, I really enjoyed that car, but only owned it nine months, which is a, a disappointing, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, All right, so when does the – what comes first? So in your garage at the moment, what came first? What was the first one out of the out of the trio that you have now? Well, let, you can talk about the Alpha as well because you had an Alpha as well, didn't you? Which you said you yeah, recently right. sold. Yeah. So what came yeah. first? Yeah, so the nine eleven T, the orange nine eleven T. So that that came first. So um, so that nine six four I had, um, we we did, did a lot of track time, and and there'd be a group of us would disappear off to a track in the North Island somewhere, and we'd drive around and um but but there's a Porsche specialist down the way that we you know know well and so we all drop in and have a cup of tea there and and so in the corner was a, a sorry looking 911 T. It was in gunmetal colour and it was um a little bit beat up. But it had the back screen out and um I could see the orange around where it hadn't been painted. Oh okay. Um, yeah signal orange. And so um, I sort of got talking to the owner of the restoration shop, and and uh, before you know it, I'm I'm building a hot rod. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So what is this car? Tell tell the listeners what it is. What year is it? Yeah. So it's it's a 1970 911T. It's um okay. it's it's ex California. It came over to New Zealand in 1996. Um, and it's uh, original Signal Orange. It's um it's an all steel body. It's not um it hasn't got fat guards or anything. It's just just completely standard. So, um. Yeah, so we sort of matching numbers. Uh, no, 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 which is important. That's an, an important aspect, and it, it enabled to be what it is today, which is great. So, so I, I started talking to, uh, to to Steve, the owner of the restoration shop, about it, and um, and, and we agreed to sort of hatch a plan. And because it wasn't matching numbers, we we decided that an R-Grup style car would be just the thing to have. And yep. so that, and again, for me being practical, I, I love long hoods. Um, and if it had been an original 911T 2.2 on carbs, I, I probably wouldn't have spent the money. It'd be a lovely car, but but again, I, I wanted to go fast for it to start. When you wanted to start, you know, for it to stop, for it to be beaten to death on a track and come back the next day. And while 911T 2.2s can probably do that, um, I just wanted a bit more out of it. So. So it um, it evolved, the spec evolved, and we agreed that we'd drop a 3.2 uh, in it from a 85 Carrera, and we'd drop a lot of other 3.2 and 911 SE parts, and in terms of the suspension and the you know the suspended platform and things. So it it's um yeah it's a lightweight hot rod. It's all steel, but it's a thousand and fifteen kilos. Wow. And it's and it's standard 231 horse, um, and it just it starts and stops. Everything was rebuilt, the motor, the box, the suspension, everything. So it's um. It's just as I wanted it again. The, the, the practical aspect of me, is, um, you know, I want a car that's going to going to go and not cause me any trouble um, and will do it. So when you bought this car, you knew exactly what you wanted to do with it. Once you saw it and you knew it wasn't a matching numbers, you knew exactly yep. what you wanted, and you wanted a, a, a car you could drive on the track as well that you could enjoy on the track. Yep. yep so yep, yep. the specialist, mm-hmm. sorry, David, the specialist you used in New Zealand, you've used him before. To, he did all the rebuilding work. He did all the work for you, or he organised it all. How did it, how did that all work? Yeah, so he's he, he's pretty well known in the restoration and fix-up circle. So he, um, yeah, he'd, he'd worked on my uh, nine six four just as in terms of checkover and servicing, and and but but got a good reputation for he's a racer from way back, um, you know, a race series champion, all that. So so you know, very very good reputation, and, and um, you know, trusted to to know that you're going to get a good product. So yeah, uh, it was just natural that uh, he had the car. Um, it was a little bit worse for wear. Um, 
and he was going to do something with it. So it was just logical that we, you know, come to an agreement and work up a spec and get on with it. That was kind of how it started, as simple as that. So how long did that build take you before you got the finished car? Um, about two years. Two years, mm. so quite a while. Mm. Quite a while. Quite a while, yeah. Yep. And finding mm. the right engine, you said you put a 3.2 into it. Um, yep. Did you, were you particular about the engine you found? Did, were you, or it didn't really matter because it's going to be completely rebuilt? Yeah, it was rebuilt anyway. It was, in, it was just in another crashed wreck in his shop. Um, 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 ironically, in a Carrera 3.2 that I'd looked at many, many years ago, um, you know, possibly buying it, but didn't. And, um, because yeah, there's not that many cars in New Zealand, you know, that you, you kind of get to know yeah, most yeah. of the good ones. So, yeah, so it was a bog standard 3.2. And, um, and, and what appealed to me was just again reading articles on them and you know, 911 and Porsche World and about how bulletproof they are. And, um, you know, and that was important. So, a standard motor question I have for you though is because I'm no expert, right? So, putting a 3.2 Carrera engine in a 911T, is there any issues that you have to overcome? Were there any major obstacles when, you know, your specialist was putting the engine in there or he'd done mm. these swap outs before? Yeah, he'd done them before. And, and again, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a mechanic or anything, but um, I think it was as straightforward as, uh, and, and, and the, the experts will correct me here, but because um, it came with a 915 box as well. So the same box okay. matched to the motor. Yeah. And, uh, and I, and I believe that um, if you're fitting a, a 3.2 and a 915 into a early chassis, you just got to, hit part of the transmission tunnel with a sledgehammer to make a little bit of clearance for something or right. else drop the or else just lower the engine 10 mil on the mounts or something like that okay. so yes yeah, so I, so I think i got a combination of either but but again i, I i'll be corrected on that I'm, but I'm it works quite, that's uh, the main thing it yeah, works yeah. well <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely like it, it seemed to go in pretty well and I, and I guess the you know the electrics are just providing power to the engine and it's all self-sufficient so yeah it's and, and it hasn't missed the beat since you know i've done a lot of miles on it and it's been fantastic so when you do that sort of build, you re- you redo all the wiring, et cetera, or you know, all that's yeah, all completely yeah. done. Yep, yes, yeah, so everything was done. And again, it was all about that, you know, um, you know, my, my comments to Steve were, hey, look, look, um, I just want this thing to to run and run for a long time and and take a thrashing and come back the next day for another thrashing. And and so um with that in mind, uh, it was a pretty clear sort of a spec, you know, make sure nothing's gonna go wrong. Pretty okay. So, so from your mm-hmm. You know the feeling, the driving experience. You've had the 993, you've had the 964, which was tweaked, and now you're in yep. the uh, 911T 3.2. Yep. Though, how yep. is the driving experience in 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 this car compared to the other two 911s you you've owned? Yeah, so um, it, it's way different. Um, but um, I'm, I guess you know, I guess in that 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 um, that that whole 911 lifetime experience for me, which was you know just absolutely wanting one when I was a kid, not driving one till way later. And then discovering them um, in terms of what they feel like, 993, 964. Um, and I guess while I love the 993, uh, um, I kind of felt that, and it's it's true, Porsche worked hard to knock the rough edges off because that's what happens, you know, when you try and evolve a, 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 an old platform to its zenith. Um, and the 993 was that you you start to do things to it to try and you know, smooth it out or make it competitive with the Ferraris or the Hondas or whatever's going on yep, around it. Yep. Um, so... Yeah, so for me, it was all about the whole thing was about that quintessential 911 experience, which was um, total tactile feel. And um, the car was left hand drive, which I was just I was so happy about because I figured if I'm going to build this thing, I want maximum weirdness because there's no point building something to make it easy, you know, or or um, you know, um, or accessible or anything like that. Sorry, David, were you tempted to do a right hand drive conversion? I mean, I wouldn't no. personally, but were you no. tempted? No, 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 I, no, I, I was I was secretly really happy it was left-hand drive because i thought i want this thing to be the most authentic weirdest you know hardest driving experience you can get and i'm i've driven lots of left-hand drive cars in europe but not so many left-hand drive cars on the left-hand side of the road it's a bit different um yeah, yeah. and so i thought well that's that's another thing i'm going to get good at and it's going to be fun learning so um, i absolutely love it uh, so yeah it, it was all about um you know how can i build the most authentic and and some might say that dropping a, a bog standard 3.2 in is not that authentic, um, but you know it's got a rowdy back box on it, and it's um, you know it's loud as anything. It shakes, and it you know there's no under seal in the car, <laughs> and there's it's no super loud as well. It must be crazy yeah. with that power and, and the weight. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's fantastic. So it's um, not twitchy. No, no. It's, it's sorted on the road. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So, so that's another thing that's really surprised me. Is um, and again, I'm no, I'm no, um, you know, I'm no expert at driving cars super fast. I mean, I'm, I'm capable, but I'm, I'm nothing like a race driver. And and so the whole 911 thing about um, you know backing off in corners, this thing's never never caught me out. And uh, I just feel so comfortable in the car. You know, used to the left hand drive. I'm used to the long throw of the gearbox. That you got to hit the brakes real hard because nothing's there's nothing helping you. Um, you know, the big 380 mil wheel to get a good good bit of leverage on it. And um, and so when we go on road trips, I'm totally comfortable. If, if the road's dry um, and it's flowing, you know, third, fourth gear, I just love it. And, you know, with 231 horse and 1,000 kilos, you're, you're up there with the 964s, 993s, you know, 996s. Yeah, yeah. Piece of cake, you know, piece of cake. So with mm. that weight, David, and with that that power, did you have to – what sort of brakes did you have to put on the car then? Did you have to upgrade yeah, so, them to uh, – yeah, yeah, so it's got uh, 3.2 brakes. Um, 3.2, uh, okay. Yeah, all, um, all around it's got a 3.2 frame steering rack. Um, it's got adjustable conies, um, adjustable banana, uh, adjustable um, spring plates. It's totally tunable. It's um, X racer, so he kind of knows how to set up a car, and it, it just really shows because it's – yeah, yeah, so it's got um, adjustable conies, um, adjustable rear spring plates, so you can set it up really well. Um it's just running on the original deep six alloys, so it's only got one nine five sixty five fifteen tires, which which again add to the you know the character of the car in terms of its you know road road presence, and it's just a lovely car, a lovely lovely smooth car to, to drive fast, and I, I'm I'm totally comfortable in the car, which is which is fantastic. Important. So when did the build finish? How long have you been driving that car for? Uh, so I got it uh, I got it on Christmas Eve two thousand and fifteen. So uh, that's I don't know okay. five. Yeah, so five, five happy years. years. Yeah. So it's a car that yeah. you you you're not going to part with. That's one of those cars that's always going to be there, or you could be tempted yeah. if the price was right. No, I, I think it'll always be there because I put too much into it. Um, you know, uh, both dollars and, and and thinking. You know, thinking time and in, in the in the two year build spec, it was all about how I wanted it. You know, specking up the interior. It's got a really cool interior in it. Um, I'll send you some photos after this. Yeah, I was um, going to say I've only yeah. seen the picture mm. on on your Facebook mm. that you sent me, and it's it's mm. a nice looking car, that's for sure. It looks yeah, like yeah, a, so looks it's like a, a really yeah. no, interesting yeah. interesting car. Yes, yeah, so it's got a really cool interior, and um, yes, yeah, so there's too much emotional equity for me to to part with it. Um, so you know that, that's definitely a keeper. And, and every time I drive it, it's and again it's it's because it's it's so reliable. You hop in it after two months, you start it and you drive it. Fantastic. Great. All mm. right, so you got mm. the three point two hot rod. Are you driving yep. other cars at the time? You have just a daily car that you're using as well. That's not your daily car, right? Yeah, yes. No, no, no. So that, that that's the endless stream of BMWs, Golf, Scaroccos, Golf okay. Rs, Golf GDIs, you name it. There's, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm a Merc A250 Sports. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a serial um, German sort of fastish car kind of guy. And uh, cool. And it's interesting because you know, I sort of put those over there and say, well, are my daily drivers are going <laughs> to cost some money and, and I'm going to lose a shitload. But hey, that's. <laughs> That's yeah. what you do over there. And these but are the ones here. I make money on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. So we've got you got the 911T, you got the 3.2 hot rod, uh, one of your favorites. What comes next? In the garage you've got at the moment, what comes next? Does the yes. other 911 come or is it is it the Ferrari? Yeah, so the 911 SC comes. So um, uh, at a track day, I don't know, not long after I got the T, um, had a bit of a brake issue and uh, went off the front straight and sort of uh, ran along the tire wall a bit. So that that put that out of action for six or nine months. So, um, so I I sort of saw an SC come up and and again like if, if we go back to 1981, 82, you know, uh, car yards, 911s, 911s, 911SCs, red 911SCs, red 911SCs with Pasha trim, and what do you know? A red 911 C with with Pasha with comes Pasha. up. It's an 80, really with Pasha. Yep, wow, yep. And it's an 80, that, they don't come up very often, yeah. do they? Every time you look at no. these, they're always got the leather seats, then, or they might yep. have the Porsche riding seats on them. You know, with the, just the Porsche with that sort yep. of stripe. Yep. But Pasha never really comes yeah. up that much in SCs. No, no. So it was it, 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 XUK. It came over to New Zealand in 80, 89, I think. So it's an eighty two two hundred four of Euro, uh, UK spec. Um, it's a SC Sport. It had the turbo tail, which I've, I've taken off since. But just I, I got a because this this was what I this is what I wanted. You know, this very car, and I, and I guess the nine nine three the the nine six four, yeah, <laughs> you know, a yeah. bit of a, a, yeah. a you know a bit of a sideshow to the main act, and, and so this was my cheapest Porsche by a long way, but. Um, I just love it. I, I absolutely love it. It's it's completely as it came out of the factory. Um, 
just a, a wonderful car. Mm. No, I'm really, I'm really, I, I don't know why I overlooked them for so long, but I really like the idea mm. of an SC. Um, and that, yeah. you know, as you, if you've listened to the previous episodes, you know, James in, in um, Melbourne from Porsche Platz, uh, RSR Classic in Melbourne. I mean, he's a big SC fan uh, and he's sort of, you know, listening to him. And that's when I sort of started first thinking about it. And obviously prices mm. are still on the rise. They're on the rise now in SCs because everything else has gone crazy. Um, yep. But they sound like a great, uh, a great car. So this car is this is the SC something you're keeping pretty much as as stock? Have you have yep. you tinkered with it much, or you just left it at stock? No. And you said it was a sport one. Sorry, David, sport one. Mm. Is that the one with the really the, the really nice seats with the, the sport seats with the big bolsters? Is that that one? Um, I, I, uh, the, the the seats have flattened out over time, so they're not they're not that good anymore. <laughs> okay. But. Um, uh, it, it, it's got the front lip spoiler and it came with the turbo rear spoiler um, I mean, as standard um, f- from the UK, but I've, I've since removed the turbo spoiler. So it's got the 16 inch Fuchs, um, you know, the uh, black window trim, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, um, I, I'm not entirely sure how they sold them in the right. UK, but uh, you know, over here it would have been called an EC Sport. Yeah. Was it high mileage? Yeah, it's it's done um, it's done 101,000 genuine miles. Genuine miles, okay. Yeah, you can track uh, you can track mileage in New Zealand pretty easily with the there's a, a database where you can see when the the safety checks were done and as long as the the curve is nice and straight and consistent and it doesn't drop or rise or whatever, it's yeah you can track them pretty well. So, so yeah, it seems to be really going good. back. Sorry, going back when you you know you said you know you used to notice these cars and the iconic feature of this car is is the whale tail. Um, was mm. there a reason why you didn't want to leave the whale tail on the SC? Yeah. Um, yes, I guess um, you know, jumping back to the early '80s again, and, and and there's a there's a classic car show on that's every year in Auckland that um, my dad used to take us to, and that's where you get your 911 fix because, like I say, you just didn't see one for a year until you came to Auckland and came specifically to find them. And so I just got confused as hell because I, I I had all the Porsche brochures, I, I read all the magazine articles, and there was 911s that weren't turbos that had tails, and I thought, what the hell's going on? You know, how, how does this happen? How can you have a you know, a tail on a on a non-turbo, and it just confused the hell out of me. And then not only that, but there were several different styles of tails, and, and I was you know too young to really know, or you couldn't jump on the net to research. It was all about um, just trying to find out, you know. So um, now I've always preferred you know the the narrow body cars that um, that you know don't sort of support a turbo tail that well. Like the the three point two Carreras with a tail are, are good because the tail is not that heavy, but a turbo tail is a high sided T tray. And just without the, it's just my personal view, you know, without the pump guards, they just, they just feel a bit heavy on the back end, you know, in terms of its look. So, and pretty simple conversion. So I, I just like the pure shape without it. Um, but, but that said, if I had a 930 turbo, I'd absolutely love the tail. Yeah, I agree with you, actually. <clears throat> I like mm. the SC X, X tail. I like it when it's just got mm. the clean back. I think it looks very, you know, with mm. that, with that, um, you know, the, the badging and everything, I just think it mm. looks just beautiful. It's just like a perfect yeah. sort of re-rammed. Yeah, wow. yeah, and, and even think, yeah, and even things like it's got six and seven inch Fuchs, which are not seven and eights, and and I, I like the way the seven inch rears are a little bit tucked. You know, I, I really really love that look, and I've got spaces, and I've had twenty five mil spaces on before to pump them out, but I just prefer it. You know, them sort of pulled in a bit and just looking like it should. Uh, and I, I just love it for what it is. A nice ordinary SC. Yeah, yeah. no, it's great. How long have you had that car for? Um, I think about um, four or five years, maybe. Yeah. Mm. So quite a while you've you've you hold on to them that's for sure. So what is the mm. <clears throat> for the listeners what do you what is the main difference then between you know, we keep coming to this comparison because it always is about you know when people are looking for a Porsche what do they buy? I mean it's always based on price I guess on and your budget. Mm-hmm. But what is the, the the SC? Is that like the is that the most perfectly rounded air cooled you think or what do you think about the SC mm-hmm. compared to say the 993 the 964 even the hot rods a bit yeah, different yeah. but how do you think it compares? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, interesting because if you if you sort of track my history now, started 993, 964, uh, jumped to a 911T, and then a G series. So I've had the four. You know, I've had the yeah. you know the four main uh, air cooled cars, and, yeah. and 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 I guess what it says is that I'm I'm looking for that genuine, you know, early experience. So um, what I love about the SC is that it's um, it's just creamy smooth and totally refined. Like well, my car's a bit rattly. It, 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 it actually had a competition life when it first came to New Zealand, uh, so it's been been around the track and had some, but it's totally back to a road car now. So it, it's just about that that creamy smoothness, you know, turbine like smoothness. The the, the nine one five, which is rebuilt, beautiful shift, 
Um, and I drove Paul's 3.2 G50 today and thought, man, this is next level. Um, this is lovely, but then the SC has got its own character as well. You know, um, you know, wonderful, revy, talky motor. You don't have to thrash the hell out of it to get, you know, to make good way in it. So I, I just love it because it's, you know, it, it's to me what an 911 should be, which is sort of, you know, rougher and raw on one hand, but, you know, creamy, smooth and German on the other. You know, just a lovely combination. Right. Mm. So gearbox wise, let's get into the controversial mm. one because you just touched on it. Then mm. Paul's got the G fifty three point two Carrera. Paul, who was on a few uh, previous owner stories from New Zealand, who's also got the uh, GTS nine nine seven, and he's got a three two eight GTS. So yep. you say you jumped into Paul's car. So the nine one five, the G fifty. Which one do you prefer? Well, I um, I really love Paul's car because it's 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 a it's it's a much better car. It's it's New Zealand new. It's done a hundred thousand kilometres. It's untouched, never been apart. Whereas my SC, you know, it's hundred thousand miles, seven or eight years older. Been been on a track in its early life, so it's had it's had stuff. Mine's, you know, mine could do with some. It's a lovely car, but it could do with taking apart and rescrewing together okay. certain aspects of it. <laughs> so you can feel the difference here. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you know, and again, I'm, I'm no expert on suspension or anything like that, but I, you know, mine could do with a, a go. It's a lovely car, but it could do with going over. Um, so, but but to compare the two, like I, you know, I, I love the three point two because again, it's just that next level of wonderful refinement. And um, but yeah, comparing a, a nine one five to a G fifty, just different things, you know. Like uh, the nine one five, my nine eleven T, I love because it's long throw and it's just part of that whole. You know, like when you're driving it fast, it's arms and legs you're doing the dance you know um and that's that's what i love about it whereas the you know the g50 i felt today you could just drive it to wellington and be totally comfortable whereas my 911t you probably wouldn't want to do that you know just right to, right you know, just that much harder so yeah i think it's just next level refinement and um certainly still being a g body air called the 3.2 with a g50 is still a wonderful wonderful car and um, I wouldn't like to choose, you know. I wouldn't like to choose, but but <laughs> good, good but, but if yeah, but if there's but if there's an SC um, and a G50 Carrera next to each other, I'd probably go G50 Carrera because it's just a you know it's just right. It's actually the car I want. Oh, I love my SC, but if a you know a, a guards red. 3.2 G50 was kind of New, there. New I'd Zealand probably... delivered has to be New Zealand delivered, or it doesn't matter. Um, it, it probably doesn't matter these days, but a, a New Zealand delivered car is a unicorn, you know, because there were so few of them. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and they generally look like if it's a New Zealand delivered car back in the 80s, people like Paul and I will know about it because we saw them. You know, we saw them when we were kids and we knew who owned them and what what was being done to them. You know, and so they would have can... been very expensive then, right, in New Zealand because New Zealand prices are reasonably high, aren't they? Are they yeah, high? yeah, and yeah. But, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, probably a little bit better now, but back in the eighties, they were they were moonbeams. I don't know what they were new, but they were they were just um, ridiculously expensive. I mean, they still are. There's still too much, you know, still too much NZ tax going on. It, it, you know, we can bring stuff out of the UK better than we can buy here. You know, uh, for new cars, yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, and, and pay. That. Yeah, that's the best thing about NZ, isn't it? About New Zealand, that you can bring cars in from the UK. Yeah, we can, and um, uh, yeah. So, so you know, there's a there's a pretty good trade on. You know, VAT qualifying 2020, 2021, whatever's, you know, whatever's in your save 30 or 40 grand off this price. And a lot of guys are doing it. Um, and yep. I'd, I'd do the same. I think, you know, like it'd be wonderful to have the cup of tea and then pull the cover off the car at the showroom in Auckland here. But, you know, that's a 30 or $40,000, yeah. you yeah. know, uh, thing that you're, that you're signing up to. So, all right. So the mm. 911T, the 3.2 hot rod, that's staying. That's not, that's not a car that's going to go. But the, the yeah. red SC, the 82 SC, that's mm. if a good, G fifty three point two Carrera came up, you would say maybe I'll switch it out. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I probably would. Yeah, I probably would. Just, just in terms of, you know, like a, a three point two Carrera is a better car, right? It's just a you yeah, know, an evolution yeah. of the species. I, um, I kind of criticised the evolution of species before, but this is you know the SC and the three point two are not too far apart. Yep. Mm-hmm. Has is there anything major you've had to do to the SC though since you've owned it? Are there any major issues that have come up in SCs that um, people should look out for if they're thinking of buying one? Yeah, um, it, it's it's been pretty solid. Like it, it didn't come with a with a great history in terms of, uh, but but um, I, I, I know the motor was rebuilt and the gearbox was rebuilt. Um, but I don't know when and by who. Um, there was just telltale signs. And again, I'm no mechanic, but the people who know what they're looking at can look at things and say, yeah, that's been a part and there's some whatever. Um, probably the big thing was the CIS. Um, we had to go through the CIS because uh, uh, when I got it, it was sort of slightly stammery on a on a light throttle, so it was sucking air or doing something. Right. Um, so, so we just had to go through that and I, um, I sort of got lucky that, uh, another guy I know had a, 
he was ripping the entire CIS off his engine, um, which he had been through totally to put on PMOs or or, or, or Gen Vs or whatever. And so we sort of came to an arrangement where we'd just whip the top off my motor and put his top on my motor and everything was hunky-dory. So okay. uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, so that that was probably the most effective way of doing it because I, you know, again, I, I, I don't know how to troubleshoot a CIS and I don't think many people do, but um, you can start with one part and just keep going. So, yeah, I just got lucky that uh, I, I found a fully sorted system and that just t- transformed the car and uh, uh, MSD ignition as well um, okay. uh, yep. at, the, at the same time. Yeah, so it just transformed the car to a creamy, smooth, very strong, you know, lovely, lovely puller. So all in all, it's been pretty reliable. It's been fantastic, yeah. I, I just took it on a 1500k road trip, didn't do anything to it and um, just lovely. Yep, start, stops, wonderful car. So the SC is more of a long distance car, long longer distance car, where the hot rod is more of a small sort of spirited track, you know, quick yeah. drives. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like 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 my car choice for a road trip. We go on a lot of road trips. There's a, a half a dozen of us who do some pretty serious road trips and wonderful road trips, fifteen hundred k's a weekend, and and the T is the choice because it'll keep up. Um, you know, it's fast enough to keep up, um, and it's a wonderful experience. But it it can it's got no sound deadening. You know, nothing like that, and it can get pretty. At the end of the weekend, when you just want to get home, it's pretty hard there. And then the ST is just a level of refinement because it's a completely standard road car. So it's, it's a bit easier. Um, but, you know, just got to work a bit harder on the SC because of 204 horsepower. Yeah, know, When you're yeah. mixing it with 964s and three 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 point two boxes and 917s yeah. and things like that, it's a bit harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So the hot ride, you need, to, you need a couple of days to recover afterwards, do you, with the noise and, and, yeah. and the ride and everything? You do, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But um, but when you're in it and the roads, yeah, you know, again, um, dry roads, flowing third and fourth gear, it's there's nothing, nothing comes near, nothing, yeah. you know, it's Fantastic. the best experiences, yeah. Fantastic. Um, so, are there are there any more Porsches? That's it, right? We're out of that's no more Porsches. We go into no the, more Porsches. Yep. So then mm. you you've got the you've got the um. So when did the you said you had an Alpha? Did that go recently? Was that in the in the mi- middle of the 911s or was that after the 911s? When did that that appear? That car. Um, that was after, um, so because it filled the fourth, yeah, that was after, yeah that, yeah, that came after the Dino too. So, um, no, hang on, hang on, no, the Dino came last, yeah. Sorry, so uh, I got four spots in my garage, so there's always four, always four <laughs> things. <laughs> um, the, the two 911s are fixtures, the, the Dino, um, has come in and will be replaced by a better, better Ferrari at some point, really. Yes, yeah, yeah, I think so, yes. It, I want yeah, to talk so the Alpha came, Dino. yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. So the Alpha came along, yeah. The Alpha came before the Ferrari, and um, I had my heart set on getting a Ferrari because I always have. And and again, I thought, well, what am I going to buy? Um, I don't have an unlimited budget, so I I really like three four eights. You know, I like the odd stuff, and, and yeah. I know they you know, I know they're maligned and and all that, but but it, so with nine six fours, you know, when they yes. came out, um, uh, and they're still know, at a good price, aren't they? The three four eights, yeah, are not, not bad. They're not bad. The three four eight. I don't. I quite like the back actually. It's like a little. Yeah, so do I. It's like a small yeah. Testarossa in a way, isn't it? It's a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, yeah. So, so it, it didn't really bother me the reputation because again, I was, you know, I wanted to get into Ferraris, and I, I thought, well, what's a good starting point? And and my logic, well, it's either going to be an early one because it's got carburetors and people know about carbs, right? Um, or or it's going to be, you know, the first of the newer generation three four eight three five three five five had gone price wise, so forget about that. So, um, so I sort of thought, well, I oh, I should probably investigate three for eight. So I did. And um, one Saturday morning, uh, the local Ferrari dealer here had one. And I thought, right, I'm going to go and I'm going to buy that. Because uh, it was a lovely, you know, uh, three for eight TS. Okay. Everything was good about it. Yeah, I can't remember the price. But it was, you know, three or four years ago, prices were okay, you know. They were, they were I, I don't know what they were, but they're better than now anyway. Yeah. And so, so so I roll up on a Saturday morning and for the first time in history, they're closed. And it turns out that they were supporting a, a round of the, and, and I'll be corrected here, but I think a whole lot of uh, Ferrari um, GT3 cars had come over from Australia to do a round or something. I, I don't I don't know what it was, but okay. the shop was the shop was shut because they were out at uh, the racetrack supporting those. So, oh, that's a bit of a bugger. So just up the road's the, the Maserati um, Alpha dealer. So I wandered up there because I was just looking around and um, – Got sort of persuaded to jump in a four C and never got out of it. <laughs> Cause, really? Because it was because it was fantastic, and I thought I thought, man, this is awesome. I, um, it was six months old, so I bought it, and I thought this is this is fantastic. I've got myself a, something that's going to stop me from buying a piece of shit Ferrari. What a, okay. what an outcome! You know, this is great. It's got a warranty. 
Uh, if it breaks down, I'm sending it back. Um, it's fast. It looks really cool. It's it's such a scream to drive. So I thought, uh, fixed, you know, right, the Ferrari. Ferrari's off the table. Good. Okay. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, okay, yeah. so no 348. You've got the 4C. 4C is reliable. Yeah. It's a great car. No, no issues. No, no, it was new. Uh, well, it wasn't new, but six months old, done 1,800 Ks. And it was, um, yeah, it was great because uh, it's just a 1750cc four pot from the the range uh, with a massive turbo. Um, but what a car, you know, like, um, and again, I'm, uh, you know, I'm no driving God and, and uh, you know, there's a lot written about how twitchy they are and how this and that. And, and But I just thought it was fantastic. This thing was just um, pretty fast, you know, um, yep. a fast yep. little car, um, massive turbo. Um, the blow off valve bends space and time and it yep. you know re- reverberates the neighborhood <laughs> so lots of fun uh, yeah it was fantastic um i always drove it on paddles never an auto um it was just really cool you know like a carbon tubbed lightweight super raucous you know screaming little dog uh, i loved it yeah absolutely okay. loved it okay so you said that car killed the ferrari bug but mm. now you have a Ferrari. So what happened? Yeah. Yeah, so it didn't kill the Ferrari bug. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really liked it, but uh, still had a yearning for a, you know, a, a Ferrari. And, um, you know, I think as I get older, um, uh, I'm starting to appreciate, um, you know, the theatre that these older cars offer. And, you know, a, a 70s car Ferrari, even level where I'm with a Dino 308 GDB or GDS is just like, I can just imagine in the 70s, again, hopping in one of these and, and it being a, a, a super duper car and just being in order. So, so I mean, with my Dino, it's a, it's a lowly Dino, but I, I just hop in it and um, I just love what it is. You know, it's got, it's, it's a smell, you know, the sound, the whole lot. I just, just absolutely love it. So I, I kind of, I didn't scratch the itch with the Alpha. Yep. Right. So tell the listeners what tell the listeners about the Ferrari. I'm always interested in Ferraris, and, and you know I'm a fan of Ferrari. I, I really do like them, and I think they go well with Porsches. Mm. I think it's something about Porsche, Ferrari, BMW. Those three together is is kind of like mm. a good mix. It kind of fills every little bit of void. You know what I mean, David? I mean it's mm. it sort of works really well. Um, and I know a lot of people who look at Ferraris, they get a bit scared away from the Carburetta ones, the three hundred eights. Mm. Um, people go into the three two eights. You know what I mean? Mm. Three five five. Yep. We all love the look, but you know anyone mm. that knows about Ferraris, three five fives are really expensive to service. Um, mm. And I know the one thing about three two eights, like Paul's got the three two eight GTS, and your Dino, um, is that they're not that expensive to service in general mm. because you can access the engine. But yeah. before we get into that, just tell the just tell the listeners what you actually bought and, and what this car's all about. Yeah, so it's a. Um, um, again, I, I kind of like the underdog, you know, and I've always liked the nose. Um, I really want a three hundred eight GTB, but you know, again, you're, <laughs> you're too, you know, you're, you're two hundred up for a good one. That's a big jump, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the D knows everything a three hundred eight is, um, except it just doesn't look as good. You know, that, that's it. You know, it's a slightly longer wheelbase. So, again, allegedly, it, it's better. You know, rides and handles better, which it probably does. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a seventy seven uh, GT four Dino. It's giallo fly yellow, um, black interior. It's a UK car, um, and it came to New. I mean, in the eighties, there, there was a lot of UK cars came in because it was just—it's all about the pound dollar, you know. If, if things are right, they come in. If they're not right, they don't come in, you know. So it came in in eighty-six, um, you know, quite early on, and um, just had a long career in New Zealand. And uh, uh, I bought it out of uh, Wellington, and the chap who owned it before me had um, sort of given it a rolling restoration. He'd, he'd done all the, the heavy lifting, the engine, the box, the, the rust work, and. And all that. So it, it's a really it's a it's a good presentable car, but this you know the, probably the part that lets it down most is probably the paint work. You know, it's um it's had a with the rust work it had a, a, a bit of a respray which was blended rather than total total body. But 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 again, my practical bent sort of said, well, is this thing going to cause me any trouble? Um, and is it going to be reliable? That was yeah. the, the number one thing. Um, you know, because I I'm just I'm still afraid of big bills. So. Um, and I thought I thought again, well, you know, I'd read about them. Uh, you know, the V8s are very durable. Um. It's a part spin car, um, so you know you, you 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 look at the yellow parts box with a horse on it, and you go do a translation and find a Fiat part or some other part, you know. And uh, so yeah, so it's a uh, it's done eighty seven thousand miles, um, which is twenty thousand on the rebuilt. Yeah, it's a lot, lot of miles. Yeah, yeah, mm. that's not bad. Mm. But even with the paint you were saying, all the ones that I, mean, I mm. look at them, you know what I mean? I do look at them, and we mentioned before we started recording about Magnus Walker on Haggerty's how he did that. That was one of the mm. under-the-radar cars, the GT, you know, the GT4 Dino. But yep. it seems like a lot of them don't have great paint. You know what I mean? All the ones I see advertised in Australia, they always make the point about the paint not being perfect. So it's always like yeah. one of those things. 
Um, yeah. I guess that's mm. just because the car at one point there was very, very cheap, wasn't it? It was very cheap. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, now, they're, so, yeah. now they're yeah. about 130, I think, Australian dollars, 130,000 mm. to, I think, Classic Throttle Shop in Sydney has one for 180,000 Australian dollars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Yes, so I, I didn't see the car before I bought it. I, it was in Wellington, and um, so, so I had a guy check it out at Ferrari. And I just discussing it, I said, well, "What's it like?" And he said, "Oh, the condition's pretty good for a Dino." I kind of didn't <laughs> really know what he meant, you know, like <laughs> you know, like, yeah, what does that mean? You know, like all, all Dinos are, yeah, like, you know, like all Dinos are a bag uh, a, a bag of shit, but this yeah. one's a better one, you know. And, uh, so. Yeah, so and I think he was right. Like, um, you know, mechanically, it's it's really good. I've, I've finished off a few things that that needed doing, um, and so it's very durable now. It, it's running. Uh, the carbs cause me a, a bit of trouble, um, but again, they're just they're just Webers, you know. They just it's got four um, twin throat Webers on it, so there's a there's a bit going on there, but they're just Webers, and so they can be rebuilt, and people do know how to tune them. So you know, I take a bit of comfort in that rather than um, the electronic um, early electronic wizardry of a nine. Uh, sorry, of a three for eight, which I was a little bit afraid of, but um, but again, that's probably just Bosch stuff, you know. It's probably just some, you know. So, what what have you changed on the Dino to make it more reliable? Is there anything you've had to add to it to give it that little bit more of extra reliability? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, I, I had I had uh, my guy. Um, it's hard to find a guy, but when you get a guy, you hang on to him. I had him go in terms of you know the cam belts and just um, the peripherals, the plugs, points. Um, rebuild the carbs. Um, we had a bit of a starter motor issue. It chewed the, the teeth off the flywheel, which turned out to be a little bit expensive, but that just needed to be done. Um, yeah, so, so just peripheral things. Um, I, I'm not handy in terms of the, the greasy bits, but I'm pretty good at taking things apart that have a, a nut or a bolt or a screw and right. tidying them up and putting them back on. So I, I sort of went around the car and um, I know you, you, you probably know what it's like when you when you get a car, you, you, you take a make it your own, whether that's taking things off, putting things on or you know, making things right to, to how it should be. So uh, I did a lot of work on the front end. You know, the bumper was kind of pushed in, so I did a you know bit of a job on that, straightened it out. Um, you know, just a small superficial things. to some new lenses, performance in the UK, just, you know, simple little little things. Yeah. So the cost of ownership, mm. though, compared to your Porsches, more expensive? Mm. Yeah, more expensive. And and that's probably a little bit to do with just those bits that needed finishing. Whereas um, my, my 911 SC, I got lucky because someone had done the work. And my 911T, it was a purpose full on restoration. So from day dot, it was was perfect. So um, I guess with a Dino, you could say that I've kind of finished off the the work that the the previous owner kind of spent 10 years rolling through. And I think he right. spent 100 grand in, in, in 10 years, you know. Um, and the really good thing about the car is it's got, it's got um, a tremendous history right back to invoices with, with, with pounds on them from a oh, okay. from a dealer and well, you know, right back to the yeah the seventies and um um even an owner connection like a guy got hold of me and said that was my dad's car you know and and oh, uh, wow. and and, it, and in my file of things there was a, a picture of it with UK number plates and a and a note uh, from the you know from his dad I think oh, his dad really? passed on you know so wow. it's just just amazing sort of connection so yeah so um, I guess to answer your question yes it has you know I, I get frustrated when yeah you know, I took it out this morning I started it I thought that's a bit of a noisy fuel pump isn't it um oh no it's gone now that's okay so i might might keep going and so there's <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, i won't say there's always something but um you know it's not the type of car i'd jump in and do a road trip and i, I just wouldn't do that you know yeah it's, uh, yeah it's, i like um, it i, I like um, the image you sent me though and you know like you've got your 911s and then you've got your dino and and the thing about the dino is the fact that it is um that it is in yellow you know what i mean mm, which is not mm. as common as um a color the Dino, it's normally mm. there. I've seen red and I've seen black. I think that's all I've seen mm. advertised. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, it's a stunning color. It's a love. You know, Giallo Fly is a lovely, you know, sort of creamy yellow color. It's not day glow. It's it's just a lovely, and and it's different. You know, like yeah, I, th- I think you're right. You know, a couple of guys have got red Dinos. Say, oh, I wish I had a yellow one, and, I, and I'm kind of secretly wishing I had a red one. <laughs> um, but but you know, I'm used to yellow, and it it, it, it fits the jelly oh. bean. Car of my cars, you know, it's a, it's it's a good sad, color. Yeah. But your driveway shot you sent me, you know, with the with the red, with the orange, and with the yellow, mm. it just looked perfect. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it looked yeah, like, well, that's yeah. a cool garage. Mm. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it, it's fantastic. Yeah, so yes, yeah, so I think I'm, I, you know, I'm really loving it. But it's, but I know it won't be with me for long because it'll be replaced by something better, and and the something better I think um, will be a just a, a better Ferrari, you know, of some sort. So not another Porsche. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a possibility. So, um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of going a bit soft. Like we, we just had a 1500 kilometer road trip 
you know, and I took the SC and there was a whole mixture of cars and, my, you know, mine was the second oldest. And and so I look at these guys in 997.2s and box the, box the spiders and boxes and think, geez, those guys are having a, a wonderful time, but they're also warm um, and they've got some music <laughs> and they're probably not going deaf. And uh, so, so I think, well, yeah, that, that'd be really cool, you know, uh, something like that. But then and I, I try not to lose sight of why I built these things and why I have them, which is for the surreal driving experience. So um, on the one hand, I really like taking the 911T and the SC because that's what it's all about. But on the other hand, the capability of a more modern, you know, 997.2 or whatever on a road trip would just be wonderful. But then I'm, I'm also conscious of the fact that I'm working nine tenths and they're working six tenths, you know, for the same buzz, you know. Um, yeah. So, know, so maybe another mm-hmm. 911 will replace the uh, 4C. Yeah, 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 I think so. Like, um, yes, yeah, so a candidate is, you know, like a lot like Paul's car, it's a, you know, like a 997.2 manual of some sort. Um, you know, something like that. I, uh, you know, 991's probably be a fantastic car, but again, it might be just too, too good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I, I won't, I'll never say I'm over 993s, but I've been there. 964s have flown the coupe, you know, um, you need too much money to buy one of those. And, and again, I've done that. So, yeah, I, yeah, it, it's interesting. I, yeah, a lot of, it'll be something more modern and capable. Which, um, you know, on the other side, like like the kids have just left home, gone to university. So there's my wife and I, and we're thinking, well, we got to go get out and do some road trips. And, and an orange 911 T is not the one to take your wife. Yeah, in. It's yeah. just not. Um, so, yeah. So, so you default back to your, your, your everyday car, which is yeah, that's that's no good either. So, but a, a lovely modern Porsche would be fantastic for that. But you know, with a manual gearbox and some comfort, but still yep. you could you really chuck it in. Yeah. There's a there's so, a gap yeah, there yeah, for yeah. it. That's and, for sure. There is. There's definitely a gap. Yeah. But but then on the other hand, um, yeah. You know, um, I don't know the practical side of me is coming out again, and I've I've sort of thought, well. You know how much is how much is too much. I, I, I sometimes feel guilty about owning so many cars, um, just because it's. You think, well, that's not me. I don't do that. You know, and um, I remember when I first started mixing with these Porsche guys. I mixed with some of them had two Porsches or three Porsches. And I thought, my God, how do you, how do you even justify? <laughs> you know, you know what the hell? How does you know? But but as time goes on, you sort of you sort of jump in and, and now it becomes normal. But but again, I'm I'm pretty practical, and um, you know. Uh, yeah, it's that thing though, David, isn't it? <clears throat> you know, mm-hmm. you don't have a 911, you don't have a Porsche and you think, okay, mm-hmm. one's enough. And then once you get one, yeah. you can't stop looking for the next one. I mean, I know that's happened yeah. with me. Yeah. And, and then, I, and then the, the SC and the 911 T, I, I just can't sell them because I, you know, I, I love them so much. And, um, you know, so there's two that have got to stay. So that, that, that narrows it there yep. down to, um, hey, I'm, I can't have all the cars I want. Um, yeah. I, I've even thought from time to time about chucking them all and getting a, a 458 Ferrari or something like that. Um, <laughs> I think it's good uh, to have. I think it's good you've yeah. got the variety. You know, you've got the mm. variety there, and it's 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 interesting. Mm. Interesting. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse mm. me. Um, all right, talking about road trips because we're at the uh, end of the podcast. We'd, we've yep. gone a little bit over today. <clears throat> you mm-hmm. say you like going on good road trips for the listeners. Yep. Where is a great uh, road that you love to take your nine eleven in New Zealand? A road that you would recommend if if anyone's visiting the country to um, check it out. Mm. Yes, there's so many. Um, So I'm North Island based. I live in Auckland. Uh, So I've driven the South Island a lot, but never in a Porsche. It's always been on business or, you know, renting a car. So there's a whole nother story about South Island roads. So um, all I can really talk about is North Island roads for, you know, for for me in terms of Porsche driving. But um, I mean, uh, I guess getting out of Auckland, um, you know, our our road trips where they go north, like in Auckland, you can only go north or south. There's no other, no other way. And uh, so, so if we talk about Northland, um, you know, so Northland's pretty, um, you know, pretty remote when you get further up, uh, and 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 again, the roads are empty. They're wonderful. Um, uh, so, you know, for me, the best roads in Northland are nearer the top. You know, where there's just less people, and and probably probably one of my favourite drives is from um, Awanui, a place called Awanui, which is sort of where the North Island gets skinny up to Cape Reinga, which is the very top, and it's it's probably a hundred k's of you know, like on a on a in the middle of the day, forget it because there's camper vans and tourists and all that going to the North Cape. But you get up at six in the morning, which we've done plenty of times, and get on the road, and it's just fast flowing. You know, beautiful, beautiful 911 T roads, fast flowing, lovely stuff. It's so a bit further south. There's, there's so many back roads that are again through the the farmlands, fast and flowing. There's a there's a um a road called the Mangamuka Gorge, which is actually on State Highway One, the main highway. But again, you know, far north, up early, you're not going to get troubled by people. So it's a lovely sinuously windy road going up you know going up a mountain 
Um, and I guess south of, of Auckland, we, we generally tend to head. Uh, there's a great road um, called, um, oh, I think it's called, um, what the hell is it called? Highway 22, which, uh, which sort of branches away from Auckland, goes west of the main drag down the western coastline. Um, and again, another wonderful road, lovely fast flowing with some tight stuff as well. Um, the, and uh, another great road I can think of, which we did three weeks ago, is called the Gentle Annies. I'm not sure what the highway number is, but it's between Tai Happy and Napier, um, sort of a not much used road. But again, it goes up over a saddle. Um, I don't know what's called the Gentle Annies, but certainly heading from west to east, uh, the first part going up the hill is is um, again it's 911T country. It's it's third, fourth gear, open, flowing, good visibility, um, wonderful roads, nice and smooth. Um, over the crest is a bit rough and a bit tight, um, but my 911 T doesn't doesn't like the tight, twisty off camber. You know, you can imagine wet road, green moss off camber. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're cast, you know no <laughs> ABS. Um, the, the the front the front wheels are chirping because they're off the ground half the time. But yeah. but you get clear of that stuff and, and down the other side, towards the Napier side, it's just again fast flowing, um, third fourth gear, just just wonderful roads. So. Yeah, so there's a there's a couple of favourites, um, you know, Tinaroto Road, which is um, between Napier and Gisborne, sort of going inland a bit. Another lovely fast flowing road that nobody goes on. Um, yeah, so we do a lot of road trips. You know, we got we got a, a couple coming up just before September, and there'll, there'll be a thousand, fifteen hundred k's. We'll do it over one weekend, two weekends. Um, the guy who leads it, it's fantastic. He knows all the roads, plots it out, you know, organises it for us. We just show up, you know, we just show up and follow him. Um, he's got that's, a lot. That's what's great the, about New all, Zealand, all though. Front, so we know we're, as long as we're behind and we're covered. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's yeah, what's fantastic. great about New Zealand, though, isn't it? There's so many good roads. Like, it's such a mm. great driving country. Like, it is, know? yep. It's, mm. it's no yeah, wonder it there's is. such a great car culture. Mm. Yeah, and uh, like there's roads everywhere, obviously. You know, like um, there's a lot of little settlements and, and, and the roads are generally, you know, generally okay, we, we call them, you know, B roads, obviously. It, it's worth noting that our State Highway 1 is, is only motorway for maybe 200 kilometres at max, you know, and, and the rest of it's just, you call it a B road, but but yeah. but, but you get off the, the state highways into the, the back roads and they're just lovely, you know, lovely accessible country roads that are lovely and flowing. Are Beautiful. they highly policed like roads are in Australia? Can you can you go for a spirited drive <laughs> or is it a bit difficult? Yeah. No, no, you can. We, we seldom come across um, police because the police are on the highways looking for the easy picking, someone doing 105, you know. Um, okay. That, yeah, they're not out. They're not out the back looking for you know, people, but there's too much money to be made on the highways. <laughs> <laughs> even better, even better. Yeah. yeah. All right, David, that's great. I think we're at the end. Mm. We've, we've gone a little bit over an hour, like I said, but uh, I mm. think all the listeners would have uh, enjoyed your story today. Mm, thank um, you. Like I said, a perfect combination, two Porsches, you know, your red 82 SC, your 911T. What year was the 911T? 70, 60? 70. 70. 70. 70. 70. 70 yep. 911 T 3.2 hot rod. And what year is the Dino? 70? 77. 77. 77. 77. Mm. Is that the one that has the Dino on the steering wheel or it has the Ferrari emblem? No, it's a for, badge the Ferrari. Yep. Badge the Ferrari. Yeah. Yep. All right. Mm. Um, okay. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for being on Owner Stories. Mm, thank you. It was great to chat today. Yeah, and I'll, I'll send you some. I'll send you some nice pictures. Yeah, absolutely. I want to see. Mm. I want to see the interior of that hot rod. Oh, it's lovely. Yeah, it, it's it's it, it's like a gentleman's club. It's beautiful. <laughs> I think you know what I mean when you see it. You'll, you'll want to get out a cigar and have a really have a cool. relaxing time. Yeah, it's no, ab- yeah, absolutely. Send me an image of that. <laughs> I do like the yeah. interior of the Dinos, which I said to you before as well. I know they come in leather yeah. or the fabric, but those seats are just this. It's so seventies Italian. It really is just it is, so yep. iconic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yep, lovely. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Mm. All right. Thanks, David. Okay, that's great. Great. Thanks for your, thanks for your time. Cool. All right, everyone, uh, that was Porsche Cooled Owner Stories number 39 with David uh, from New Zealand. Like I said, uh, 911T, 3.2 hot rod, orange, very nice, uh, and his red SC and his Ferrari Dino GT4. Um, That's about it today. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.